I did something terrible, there was no sound because I'm trying to control everything. I'm gonna have to introduce you again. Is that a problem? Sorry. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, so, this is Steve Brusati. He's an American paleontologist. He's a professor of the University of Edinburgh and one of the most respected evolutionary biologists and paleontologists in the world. Um, nowadays, he focuses his research in tyrannosaurs and he had discovered over 30 dinosaurs. He wrote many books, including this one that I have on the rise and fall of dinosaurs that we're going to talk about today. And of course, he wrote many papers for important journals. E não em português. Uh, a gente vai falar hoje com o Steve. Ele é um paleontólogo americano que estuda na, hoje em dia na Universidade de Edimburgo. Ele é um dos mais respeitados é, biólogos evolucionistas e hoje em dia ele foca sua pesquisa em tiranossauros, tipo tiranossauro rex mesmo. Ele já descobriu mais de 30 dinossauros e ele já escreveu vários livros. Esse aqui a gente tem em português também, Ascensão e Queda dos Dinossauros. Um, e é isso que a gente vai falar hoje. A palestra vai ser em inglês, mas de qualquer modo a gente vai colocar as legendas depois. Ok, Steve, when you're ready. Ok, let me see if I can uh, share the slides. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Let's see. Ok. Let me try this one more time. You must can't, can't share your screen. Sorry, <laughs> you must grant permissions and order to screen share. Uh, let me see. Let me just. Uh, it's okay. Oh, I, okay, that should be fine. I think. Let me see. Uh, oh, wow. Firefox cannot allow permanent access to your screen. Okay, let's see. Um, hmm. How strange is that? Okay. Uh, hmm. For some reason, this is not allowing me. So let me let me just try one more thing here. And if it doesn't, we'll have a backup plan. So let me let me try and see if I can do this in um in uh, player Oh, um, maybe we can try to open a different browser. I don't know if it's gonna work. Yeah. We can do a short That's what pause. I'm do, so. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm just trying to join this with another power. Okay, let me take it. Okay, let me see if I can try and do this. <laughs> okay, okay. We cannot see you though. Uh, yes, I just turned the uh, thing off for a minute. Here, I'll turn that on. I think okay. you should do it. Hopefully. Excellent. Okay. Now, let me share this. Uh, okay. Okay. So it should be. Okay. Screen share. Yeah, we can see okay. it. Great. Okay, great. Great. So. Okay. Yes. Okay, can you see the slides now? Yes, I can. Okay, great, great. So sorry about that. I guess um, uh, have to use the Google browser and not... Uh, Firefox, whatever. All right. So thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to, to chat. And um, it's uh, it's just really cool to be able to uh, sync up with you guys. Um, I'm joining in from Scotland, from Edinburgh, where where I live and where I teach at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and I have these slides here um, about dinosaurs that more or less kind of jive with um, with the book I wrote, which thank you for that very nice introduction. And you showed the book in, in the, the English version and the Portuguese version, which is great. Uh, so there, there the covers are again. Uh, but I was really happy to have the, the book published in Portuguese about a year or so ago. Really, really cool um, just to know it's been translated into some other languages other than English so people around the world can 
read it. Um, so the book uh, talks about the history of dinosaurs. That's what I want to talk about in this presentation. And I want to do it pretty briefly because we don't have a huge amount of time. I don't want to waste too much time uh, waffling on. And um, so let, let me just give you a little bit of highlights about dinosaurs and then hopefully leave plenty of time for questions, which is what is really interesting, of course, that, you know, answering your questions or having some discussion about dinosaurs. So what I want to give you a, a brief overview on uh, is where dinosaurs came from, their origins, how they rose up to become these dominant, enormous, successful animals that lived and thrived for over 100 million years, and then how most of them went extinct. And so that story begins about 250 million years ago when the Earth looked like this, when all of the land was joined together into the supercontinent of Pangaea, which stretched from the North Pole to the South Pole. Very, very different world than today. There were no ice caps. It was very warm. There were big deserts across much of the continent. It was a hard place to live, but a lot of animals were accustomed to it. A lot of animals were adapted to, to the supercontinent world, including a lot of early relatives of mammals, a lot of amphibians, and a lot of different types of reptiles. But then, about 250 million years ago, these giant volcanoes started to erupt in Siberia, in what is now part of Russia, and they caused global warming. All kinds of carbon dioxide, methane, these toxic gases went into the atmosphere, warmed up the earth, led to a heat wave around the world, and that led to a mass extinction. And this was the biggest extinction in earth history, when maybe up to 95% or so of species died out. And it was not a good time to be alive by any means, but some animals did make it through. And some of the animals that survived then had a new world to live in after those volcanoes stopped erupting. And from these survivors came the ancestors of many of today's most familiar groups of animals, like mammals and turtles and lizards and so on. Now, when I was a, a, a grad student, I was really interested in this extinction, and I was really interested in the questions of what lived and what died and how quickly did things return to normal and how did the world change because of those volcanoes. So I started to do field work in, in a few different places, uh, but in, including in Poland, which is maybe a place you might not think of when you think of digging up fossils. It doesn't really fit that image that we see on television of usually some Indiana Jones type of guy going out to the desert and brushing sand off the bones of a dinosaur as, the, as it's really hot and dry and dusty. That's what we see on TV, but of course paleontology is not always like that, and sometimes we go to places like this quarry in Poland where they are mining mudstone to make bricks. And now this mudstone in Poland, there's layer after layer of it. That mudstone spans the Permian, the extinction, and then the next period of time, which is the Triassic period. And you can read those layers of mudstone like you can read the pages in a book. They tell a story of how the environments change. And they also tell a story of how the animals change because there are fossils in those rocks. And so these fossils for the most part, are not bones and teeth and skeletons, but they are trace fossils. They're the footprints and the handprints that these animals were leaving behind and in the Permian during and after the extinction in the Triassic. And now, very quickly after the extinction, within about a million years or so, we see these footprints and handprints show up. This is a footprint and this is a handprint. So this was made by an animal that was walking on all four legs. You can see they're really small, just a few centimeters. And more or less, these are about the size of the paw prints that a, a house cat would make. So, you know, these, this was a small animal making these tracks, something you could hold in your arms. And it was an animal that would have looked something like this. And, and we can reconstruct it from the footprints and the handprints, but also from skeletons that match up with those handprints and footprints that are found in other places. This animal that we're looking at is essentially the ancestor of the dinosaurs. It's what we call a dinosauromorph. It's one of the very closest cousins of the dinosaurs on the family tree. This is the type of animal that dinosaurs evolved from.
And you can see this looks nothing like a T-Rex, nothing like a Brontosaurus. This was a humble animal, again, the size of a house cat. It was not a particularly common animal. It was very rare. Only about 5% of the footprints we find were made by this animal. Clearly, it was not at the top of the food chain. So it shows us that dinosaurs had a very simple, a very humble origin. During the Triassic, when these first dinosaurs, true dinosaurs, were evolving from these dinosauromorphs, the dinosaurs were not at the top of the food chain. There were other animals throughout the entire Triassic period that were the rulers of that world. And we found some of these in Portugal, another place where we did field. And this is in southern Portugal in the Algarve, a very beautiful, very touristy area, lots of uh, people on the beaches, and about 20 kilometers or so inland from the beaches is this mountainous area that's very dry, that has a lot of red rock, and that red rock was formed during the Triassic. And we first went to Portugal because we hoped we could find Triassic dinosaurs to understand how the dinosaurs were evolving as they started from those humble ancestors. But we've looked and looked, and we, we haven't found any dinosaurs yet, just because they were so rare at this time, it's hard to find their skeletons. But instead, we found hundreds of skeletons, probably, of this giant amphibian, this thing called Metoposaurus. It's basically a salamander the size of a car. And we found a graveyard, a bone bed. We've only dug out a handful of these skeletons, but it looks like there's probably hundreds of them there. And these were the animals that would have ruled the rivers and the lakes. So if you were one of these humble, early little dinosaurs, you wouldn't want to go anywhere near the water because one of these things would have eaten you. And it was no better on the land because on the dry land during the Triassic, this was the age of the crocodiles, and their close relatives. Crocodiles live today, of course. But all modern crocodiles are pretty similar to each other. They all live in the tropics or the subtropics. They all can swim. They all can waddle around on the land. They can be scary. Of course, they can be very scary. But they're not a particularly diverse or successful group today. But in the Triassic, you had all of these crocodile relatives, all these things on the screen here, ones with horns and spikes, ones with sails on their backs, ones with heads that looked like the heads of T-Rexes, ones that even lost their teeth and had beaks. You had this incredible variety of crocodile line archosaurs. And these were the things that ruled the land. So the dinosaurs weren't at the top of the food chain in the Triassic. They lived in fear, basically, of those giant salamanders and all of these incredible crocodile line animals. But then something changed. And about 200 million years ago, at the end of the Triassic period, that supercontinent of Pangaea, it started to split apart. And of course it did. Of course it did. It, that's why we have separate continents today. And now, when it started to split, first, North America separated from Europe. And South America started to separate from Africa. That's why Africa and South America look like two puzzle pieces. Now, today, that space is filled by the Atlantic Ocean. But before the water came in to fill the cracks between the new continents, the land bled out lava. So there were giant volcanic eruptions as the land broke apart. And once again, these volcanoes pumped a lot of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that caused global warming. It caused another mass extinction, not as bad as the one at the end of the Permian, but still one that maybe killed up to about 70% of all species. This extinction decimated, destroyed, almost completely wiped out the crocodile line animals. And only a few lineages made it through, the ones that lead to today's crocodiles and alligators. But on the other hand, the dinosaurs, they survived. They were the great survivors of this extinction. We don't really know why. It's one of the biggest mysteries about dinosaur evolution. There are lots of ideas. Maybe the dinosaurs could run faster. Maybe they could grow faster. Maybe their lungs were more efficient. Maybe they had feathers. All kinds of different ideas, but we don't know for sure what allowed them to survive, whereas their crocodile cousins and competitors mostly died. But regardless of that answer, and somebody will figure it out, I have no doubt, 
what happened was the Triassic ended with that extinction. And then afterwards, in the next period of time, which is the Jurassic period, the dinosaurs that survived now lived in a world that was largely free of those crocodile-type animals and also the giant amphibians. They were severely affected by the extinction, and many other things were too. So the dinosaurs had this wide open playing field to evolve on, and they started to evolve very fast. And this is when dinosaurs really became dominant. This is when some of them rose to the top of the food chain. This is when some of them started to grow to enormous sizes. This is when some of them started to develop horns and spikes and frills and duck bills and all of these amazing features that we think of when we think of dinosaurs. There is a reason it's called Jurassic Park, because the Jurassic was the time the dinosaurs truly became spectacular and they became dominant. And in the Jurassic, there were thousands of species of dinosaurs that were evolving. Many of the most familiar subgroups of dinosaurs evolved in the early Jurassic and diversified. And we are discovering so many new dinosaurs right now all over the world because, and Brazil is a great example of this, because places where Previously, there were only a few paleontologists, not many young people going into the field. Now, countries like Brazil, Argentina, China are developing. There's new universities, new courses, new museums, not always enough money. And these things do change with politics, of course. But in general, you look at what's happened in Brazil and you compare the state of paleontology to now to what it was a few decades ago. It's incredible. And it's young people like a lot of you, students who are going out and discovering a lot of the most amazing fossils. And it's not just little boys anymore. Oh, it's, it's women and men. It's students from many backgrounds. And so this has driven this golden age of paleontology. We're finding more dinosaurs than ever before, a new species turns up somewhere around the world once a week on average, which is amazing. And we're even finding dinosaurs here in Scotland, another place you might not think of when you think of digging up dinosaurs. This does not fit the television stereotype. This is what it looks like in the one place in Scotland where you can find dinosaurs. And this is an island off the west coast in the Atlantic Ocean called the Isle of Skye. And it is a beautiful landscape of mountains and crags and moors, coasts, very rugged coastlines, lots of beautiful green and brown colors on the landscape. It is a gorgeous, enchanting place. It's a bit of a difficult place to do field work because it's cold. <laughs> And it's raining all the time, and it's windy, and it's wet. And most of the rocks that have the dinosaur fossils are found along the coastlines. So we're always having to uh, look at the tide tables. We have to go and look at low tide, because at high tide, the rocks are covered up. So it's a challenging place to work, but it's a wonderful place to work because it's a place where we take our students, and we train our students to dig up fossils. And... It's no joke. It's completely serious. I'm completely honest when I say the students always find the best fossils all the time. And this is the prime example of that. This is Amelia in the middle there who was a PhD student at the time. And she found this amazing pterosaur, a pterodactyl skeleton, which we are really, really excited about. And we're working on that. But pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, so I won't <laughs> say any more about that. But this is just to show, you know, we train our students in different techniques. This is Moji, who is studying the fish that lived in the water when the dinosaurs were on the land. And she's collecting some little fish bones and teeth with this power tool here because the rocks are very hard. You have to cut the fossils out. For bigger fossils, we need bigger tools. And this is... Doogie Ross, who we work with, a local on the Isle of Skye. He grew up on Skye. He built his own museum, and that's where he exhibits a lot of the fossils that he's found. He's also a builder by trade, so he, he has his own saws. He knows how to use them, and here he is cutting a dinosaur bone, which is down here outside of the rock. I could talk about Skye forever. I just want to tell you one story, though, of what I think is our most interesting discovery, at least so far, of, of uh, dinosaurs. This is uh, at a place at the far northeastern tip of the island. It's a place called Duntulum, and I'm taking this picture standing in the shadow of 
a 14th century castle. It is the ruins of this castle. It's a very Scottish scene. Now, you can see the sky is blue. It's sunny. It's not raining. You might think, why are we not collecting fossils? Well, that's because it's high tide. You can see the water is going almost all the way up to the grass. And so we have to wait till the tide goes down. And when the tide does go down, that beach turns into a big rock platform where this Jurassic Age rock juts out into the water. And we went there one day about five years ago because a geologist friend of ours had found a little bone there, a little jawbone. And we thought maybe there'd be a dinosaur skeleton. We were really excited. And we looked all day. We were on our hands and knees looking at every little bit of that rock. And we didn't find any dinosaur bones. And it was very, very disappointing. And so at the end of the day, about 7 o'clock at night, we started to pack up to get in our vehicles, to go back, to cook dinner. And as we were walking, we started to notice there were these big holes in the rock. And at first, we didn't know what to make of them. But then we noticed that there were actually over 100 of these holes. And they were all more or less the same size and shape. And when you looked closer, you could see that there was a bit of a pattern to them. There was a bit of a left-right, left-right zigzagging pattern. And we could see these things from the side. And they were actually impressed into the rock. So they must have been formed by something that was pressing down back when this stuff was just soft mud before it turned into rock. And some of them were filled with the harder rock, and we could see these little bits sticking out, one, two, three, four. And sometimes they were paired together, and there was a bigger horseshoe-shaped one and a smaller crescent-shaped one in front. And they were really big. This is the biggest one of all. It's about 70 centimeters across. It was bigger than a car tire. And now after a few minutes, it dawned on us that, wait a minute, we actually had found dinosaur fossils. We wanted skeletons. We didn't find any bones, but these were a different type of fossils. They were footprints and handprints, but huge ones, so much bigger than those ones from Poland because, of course, we're in the Jurassic period now, and dinosaurs have gotten bigger, and they're becoming dominant. And these tracks were made by the only animal, actually the only animal that ever lived on land in the entire history of the Earth that is so big that it would leave a hole the size of a car tire every time its hand or foot hit the ground. And that's this type of dinosaur, a giant sauropod dinosaur with a tiny head and a long neck and a big belly, the Brontosaurus and Diplodocus types of dinosaurs. Now, we keep going back to Sky. We keep finding new track sites. And I have an excellent student, Paige DiPolo is her name. She comes from the US like me, but she moved out to Scotland to do her PhD, her master's first and now her PhD. And Paige has a background in geology, but also in engineering. So she's very good at uh, building instruments and, and running experiments. And so Paige has been using drones to map all of these footprint track sites that we have been finding. And Paige's research shows that there are several species of dinosaurs, not only the big sauropods, but there are footprints that were made by meat-eating theropods. There are footprints and handprints that were made by stegosaurs, those dinosaurs with plates on their backs. There were others that were probably made by early duck-billed dinosaurs. And many of these dinosaurs were making those footprints and handprints as they were walking in very shallow water in a subtropical lagoon during this time in the Jurassic when Scotland was so different than it is today. So that's one example of a new Jurassic dinosaur discovery that's helping us understand how dinosaurs got big and how they spread around the world and how they were invading new environments like the beaches and the lagoons. Now, you might have noticed a few slides ago in this picture, there's this animal here in the foreground. This is a small meat-eating dinosaur, just about the size of a human. It's really similar to another species that's known from China, from much better skeletons called Guanlong. And believe it or not, Guanlong is a Jurassic Age tyrannosaur. It is an early cousin of T-Rex. And it might not look like T-Rex, it's small only our size. It's pretty skinny. It has long arms. It has this weird crest of bone on its head. But it's from these types of dinosaurs that T. rex ultimately evolved. 
So how did T-Rex become so dominant later on after the Jurassic in the Cretaceous period? Well, we have a new clue from Uzbekistan, another place you might not think of when you think of dinosaurs, but this is a new species of tyrannosaur that's kind of in between. It's about the size of a horse, so it's bigger than the earliest tyrannosaurs, but smaller than T-Rex. And this is the back end of the head, back end of the skull. This is where the spinal cord goes into the brain. This is where the, the uh, neck bones attach, the vertebrae of the neck attach. We've CT scanned this skull, We've built a digital model of the brain and the sinuses in the ear, which looks like this. This blue thing is what a tyrannosaur brain looks like, or more accurately, what the back end of a tyrannosaur brain looks like, because we don't have the whole thing preserved. The pink thing that looks like a pretzel, that's the inner ear. And the bit sticking down is the cochlea, the part that hears sound. And from this, what we can tell is that this is a big brain for a horse-sized dinosaur. And that ear has a really long cochlea, so it was really good at hearing a wide range of sounds. So it looks like tyrannosaurs evolved big brains, high intelligence, and keen senses while they were still smaller, probably in order to survive while they were living in the shadow of other big dinosaurs, allosaurs, carcardinosaurs, and so on. And then those other big dinosaurs, they died out in the middle part of the Cretaceous, and all of a sudden, a new job was open at the top of the food chain, and tyrannosaurs moved in, and that's how T. rex became the top predator. And what makes T. rex so amazing is that it is both big, but is also smart. So it has brawn, and it had brains, and that allowed it to be the biggest, baddest, meanest, scariest meat eater that's ever lived on land in the entire history of the Earth, at least in my opinion. Now, T-Rex, the Tyrannosaurs, as, as we've seen, they started small and they got bigger over time, culminating in T-Rex, which was the size of a bus. Now, there was another type of meat-eating dinosaur group that did the opposite, and these are the raptor dinosaurs. They got smaller over time. This is Velociraptor, the real Velociraptor, not the Jurassic Park version. <laughs> the real Velociraptor was much smaller, just about the size of a small dog, and it was covered in feathers. And we know that from actual fossils. We know that dinosaurs, many meat-eating dinosaurs, have feathers because of these amazing fossils that have come from this part of China, Liaoning province in the northeast, they, the first ones were found just about 25 years ago. And they were found after Jurassic Park was made. So Steven Spielberg didn't know that any dinosaurs had feathers. He didn't know we had to put feathers on his Velociraptor. But a few years later, these dinosaurs were found in China, and they are spectacular. There are now thousands of skeletons of these meat-eating dinosaurs, and they are covered in feathers, beautiful feathers, incredible preservation, because these dinosaurs lived in an environment in the Cretaceous period where there were volcanoes nearby, and sometimes those volcanoes would erupt, and they would bury entire ecosystems of dinosaurs, preserve their bodies in such pristine detail, kind of like those volcanoes at Pompeii, that Roman city that was buried by a volcano. Now, I've been very fortunate to study some of these feathered dinosaurs with different uh, colleagues in different museums in China. This is just one museum I visited. Oh, there's all these fossils that the volcanoes bury. These fossils are incredible because they tell us how feathers evolve, and they tell us how birds evolve. And they proved once and for all that birds really did evolve from dinosaurs. What these Chinese fossils tell us, first of all, is that many dinosaurs had feathers. It wasn't just the raptors. It wasn't just the immediate ancestors of birds. But many dinosaurs had feathers, including this. These are two tailbones of a small tyrannosaur called Belong, one of those T-Rex uh, ancestors, basically. Small little thing about the size of a dog. And these things that look like scratches in the rock above those backbones or tailbones those are feathers, but they are simple feathers. They look like hair. They're just simple little strands. And a lot of dinosaurs have these types of feathers. And it goes without saying, but there's no way that this dinosaur or any of these dinosaurs with those feathers could fly any more than we can fly with our hair. 
it just wouldn't work. Of course not. So that means that feathers evolved in a simple form first, and they did not evolve for flight, but they probably evolved for the same reason that hair evolved in mammals, and that was to help keep these dinosaurs warm and to retain body heat. And that's how most dinosaurs kept it. So a lot of dinosaurs, maybe even all dinosaurs, had some simple type of feather, the same way that all mammals have some type of hair. But one group of dinosaurs changed their feathers. These were the raptor dinosaurs. They started to pack those feathers all over their bodies. They started to line up those feathers on their arms. And those arm feathers got longer. And they started to branch out. So they weren't just simple little hair strands anymore. But they started to branch. And they started to become flat. And in some of these raptors, these feathers became wings. This is the wing of a raptor dinosaur called Genwan Long. You can see all the individual feathers here, attaching to the forearm, attaching to the hand. The size, the shape, the position of these feathers is just like in the wings of modern birds. But Genwan Long is not a bird, it is a raptor. It is a close cousin of Velociraptor. It was the size of a big dog. And it could not Here's the entire skeleton. Here's the wings. There's that wing we saw earlier. There's the other wing. Look at that. Look at the gorgeous preservation. There's feathers on the tail. Look at that long tail. There's feathers on the body. So this was a dinosaur with feathers. It was a dinosaur with wings, but those wings were too small to keep a dinosaur that big up in the air. So that's interesting. Now it looks like dinosaurs didn't even evolve wings for flying, and we think they probably evolved wings as a display structure, as basically an advertising billboard they stuck off their arms in order to attract mates and scare away their rivals and claim territory and do the sorts of things that peacocks and other birds do today with elaborate feathers. Now, Gen Wan Long would have looked something like this. A raptor with feathers, with wings. The wings are too small for, to keep it up in the air. But you can imagine that it wouldn't take evolution very much to make a dinosaur like this a little bit smaller, to make the wings a little bit bigger, until you reach an animal like this that now had wings that were big enough that if it flapped those wings, those wings could provide the thrust and the lift to keep that dinosaur in the air. And it's at that point where we say birds had evolved from these raptor dinosaurs. Incredible. Birds evolving from dinosaurs. Now, I think a lot of us know this. It's become common knowledge now, but, but a lot of people still find this hard to believe. And what I always try to tell people is, look, it's not really that crazy. Just think about bats. Bats are a type of mammal. Of course bats are a mammal. They have hair. They have the same sort of you know, teeth, molars and premolars and so on that we have. They feed their young with milk. They are mammals. They are part of the mammal family tree. They are our close cousins. But they're just a weird type of mammal that got small, evolved wings, and developed the ability to fly. And birds are the dinosaur equivalent of that. Birds are a weird type of dinosaur that got small, evolved wings, and develop the ability to fly. So birds are dinosaurs in the same way bats are mammals. A bird is a dinosaur just like a T-Rex is a dinosaur, the same way a bat is a mammal just like an elephant is a mammal or a human is a mammal. And that means that dinosaurs are still with us. There are over 10,000 species of dinosaurs that live in our world today, many thousands of which live in Brazil. You think of the incredible diversity of birds in the Amazon. Those are all dinosaurs. There are more than twice the number of dinosaur species alive today as birds as there are mammal species. Amazing when you think about it. And some of these dinosaurs are majestic, like the bald eagle. Other ones, not so much, <laughs> not majestic at all, like these gulls you might see at the beach. And I think if you're at the beach or sitting by a river, or sitting by a lake, and one of these little jerks comes down from the sky and dives down and tries to spear one of your chips or your ice cream, I think in that moment, in the cunningness, the nastiness, the agility, the intelligence, the ferocity, 
you can really sense the inner velociraptor in a seagull. And that's because seagulls and all other birds are dinosaurs. They are close cousins of the real velociraptor itself. Now, they're the only dinosaurs that survive today. All the other dinosaurs, the T-Rexes, the, the sauropods, the Triceratops dinosaurs, all these other things, they died out at the end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago when the world looked like this. The continents had moved further. You now had different dinosaurs living on different continents. But 66 million years ago, you had an incredible diversity of dinosaurs living all over the world. And then very suddenly, one day, one Wednesday afternoon, let's say, this asteroid came out of the sky. It came from outer space, six miles wide, about 10 kilometers wide, traveling faster than a speeding bullet. It smashed into the earth with the force of over one billion nuclear bombs put together, and it punched a hole in the crust over a hundred miles wide. That hole is a crater that is now in, in Mexico. It's called the Chicxulub Crater. And so the asteroid hit not too far north of where Brazil is today. And this had devastating effects on the entire world. It unleashed wildfires and tsunamis and earthquakes. All the dust and dirt and all the soot from the fires went up into the atmosphere, blocked out the sun, led to the earth going dark, going cold, a nuclear winter that lasted several years. And then that was followed by global warming. So you had all these chaotic things happening because of the asteroid and the dinosaurs that were there at the time including T-Rex, which was there when the asteroid hit, Triceratops, the duck-billed dinosaurs. These dinosaurs could not cope, and they died out. And the only ones that survived were a few species of birds with big wings that could fly really well, that had beaks, that could eat seeds, that could grow fast. Even most of the birds died, too. But thankfully, some made it through, and we still have dinosaurs today. Now, I love studying dinosaurs. I still do research on dinosaurs, but my research is now turning more towards what happened after the dinosaurs died. What happened after that extinction? What lived, what died? How long did things take to turn to normal? And how did a new world emerge from that extinction? And so I've been spending a lot of time in New Mexico digging up fossils of the first animals that lived after the asteroid. New Mexico does fit the stereotype of paleontology when we see it on TV. This is a dry, dusty, desert type of badlands place, and these rocks are bursting with fossils. Now, I've started to take some of my students out there, too. This is Sarah, who's my very first PhD student. She's a postdoc now in Pittsburgh. And Sarah, uh, already in her early career, has become one of the world's experts on the animals that took over from the dinosaurs. And these are animals like this. These are the kind of fossils that we find in Mexico. Now, these kind of things might look familiar to you because you, all of you, or at least most of you, have these kind of things in your own body right now. You have these things in your mouth. These are teeth, but these are not the knife teeth of a T-Rex or the teeth of a Triceratops or a Brontosaurus. These are the characteristic teeth of mammals the molars and premolars of mammals with all their different cusps and valleys. So it was the mammals that took over from the dinosaurs. The very first mammals evolved on Pangaea with the very first dinosaurs, but they remained small and humble, and they lived in the shadows of the dinosaurs for over 100 million years until the asteroid hit. And then, very quickly, the surviving mammals took advantage of the dinosaurs dying. The mammals that lived with the dinosaurs never got bigger than a badger or a small dog. Within a few hundred thousand years of the asteroid, you now had mammals the size of pigs. Within a million years, you had mammals the size of cows. And you had meat-eating mammals, plant-eating mammals, insect-eating mammals. You had fast-running mammals, digging mammals, saber-toothed mammals, and even some mammals that had long limbs and long fingers and toes and opposable thumbs that could grip the branches of the trees they lived in. And this is one that's found in New Mexico from just a few million years after the extinction. It's called Torahonia, and it is a primate, one of the very first primates of one of our earliest cousins. 
And this just goes to show how all of this is connected. The story of the dinosaurs, the story of us. And if that extinction didn't happen, if that asteroid was a near miss, the dinosaurs probably would have continued living on as more than just birds. And mammals probably would have never gotten their chance to emerge from the dinosaurs' shadow. But that extinction did happen. Here we are. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and very happy in the 15 minutes we have left before I have to get uh, down to my fatherhood duty. I got a nine month old, a really gorgeous little nine month old boy, Anthony, downstairs who's waiting for his daddy to give him dinner. So, in the next 15 minutes, ask away any questions that you have. So, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank we you. have to thank you a lot. And really, we're going to have to do um, all the questions a bit quick because you have Anthony, and we're not going to be late for that. So the first question that we have is from Caroline. They're all from YouTube. Um, do you think Brazil is a good place for research in paleontology? Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, Brazil, I think, is one of the most exciting places in the world now, along with China, along with Argentina, um, because Brazil is it, a huge country. Uh, there's lots of rocks that have fossils of lots of different kinds. And in particular, there's fossils in part of Brazil, with Santa Maria Formation and so on, that are Triassic in age and preserve some of the very oldest dinosaurs of all, the things that people like Max Lang and his, his team studied, dinosaurs like Saturnalia. And then there's a lot of Cretaceous rocks in Brazil. There's the Santana rocks, and then there's the Boru Basin. And I've worked with a very good friend of mine in Brazil, Roberto Candero, who's, who's a professor in Goiás, who's a wonderful guy who runs an awesome course um, at the University of Goiás. And he and his students are always out finding new Cretaceous dinosaurs, and there's other teams as well. So there's you know giant long neck dinosaurs from the Cretaceous. There's big meat eaters like the Abelosaurs. There's smaller raptor dinosaurs. And a lot of these discoveries have just been made over the past decade or two. And a lot of them are made by students. There's a lot of students working on them. So the point really is, you know, Brazil is a place where there's a lot of dinosaurs and the work has really just begun, the real work. People have found dinosaurs in Brazil for a long time, but it's right now where you have a lot of students going out looking for new dinosaurs. So it's a very exciting time. And for any of you that, you know, work on dinosaurs, good luck. There's a lot more to find. So Yeah, we have a long path to to achieve. Um, the second question is from Fabricio. What are the most interesting remarks that you can make about South America dinosaurs? What, what interests me, there's a few things. You know, one of the great things about South American dinosaurs, both Brazilian dinosaurs and the Argentine dinosaurs, is the Triassic ones. These are the oldest dinosaurs in the world, the oldest true dinosaurs. I talked about this little cat-sized thing from Poland that left its footprints, but that was a dinosaur ancestor. It wasn't quite a true dinosaur, but the oldest true dinosaurs are things like Saturnalia from Brazil or Herrerasaurus and Eoraptor from Argentina. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, this is our best glimpse at what the first dinosaurs were like, so I think that's really important. And then the Cretaceous dinosaurs, some of the very biggest dinosaurs that ever lived, in fact, the very biggest sauropods that ever lived, are from South America. Things like Patagotitan and Argentinosaurus and Dreadnoughtus. And there are also some other Titanosaurs like that from Brazil. Uh, these things were bigger than Boeing 737 airplanes, which is amazing. And, you know, they were animals that would have hatched from a little egg, you know, this, this size. And they grew into something that weighed more than a jet airplane. That blows me away. <laughs> it, it, it's, that, that, to me, is just remarkable. Thank you. Um, Anna Elisa said, Steve, can you please comment a little about the shrink wrapping? I'm not, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. Um, I, saw about, I saw about that a little ago, and I never thought about that, and that dinosaurs could be a little more cute than we think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this, this uh, has to do, I think, with um, the way dinosaurs are depicted, the way they're drawn and painted and shown in art. And there has been a tradition with a lot of paleo artists um, in the past to draw these shrink wrap dinosaurs. They're very skinny looking dinosaurs, basically taking the skeleton and putting just a little bit of muscle and, and skin on it. Um, 
that's not probably how a lot of dinosaurs looked. A lot of them probably had more muscle and more fat. You know, if you were to take a skeleton of, I don't know, a, a, a buffalo or even an elephant and, and you tried to draw it, you'd never seen it before alive, you tried to draw what it looked like only based on the bones, it probably wouldn't look a lot like the actual animals. Um, so that's what artists always have to struggle with when it comes to dinosaurs. I'm a terrible artist. I'm one of the worst drawers, painters in the world. So, you know, it's something I don't, I can barely even do myself, but for the great paleo artists out there, um, you know, it's a challenge to look at bones of things that were alive hundreds of millions of years ago and try to envision what the actual animal was like. But in general, yeah, probably a lot of them were a bit fatter and a bit more muscular than, than we might have thought. Okay. Um, from Julio, could you present... Um... Sorry, could the presence of feathers suggest that these animals were homeothermic? Yeah, so this is the question of dinosaurs, whether they were warm-blooded or not, which means a lot of different things. There's lots of terminology, endotherm versus ectotherm and homeotherm, gigantotherm, and all these words. You know, when it comes down to it, there's no doubt that dinosaurs were more, dinosaurs like T-Rex and, and other Mesozoic dinosaurs were more like birds than reptiles. People used to to think they, they were a lot like crocodiles or iguanas. You know, they kind of grew slowly and they didn't move very fast and they weren't very intelligent and, and that they had cold-blooded metabolisms you know, where, where their, their body temperature basically relied on, on, on the external temperature. And uh, so now we know they were much more like birds. They grew fast. We can tell that by looking at the microstructure of their bones the texture of their bones, the growth rings in their bones. We can count growth rings. We can come up with growth curves. We can see, for instance, that something like T-Rex, you know, no T-Rex skeleton that we know of was more than, than 30 years old when it died because it doesn't have more than 30 growth lines in its bones. That meant that T-Rex had to grow from a tiny little thing that hatched from an egg into something the size of a bus within a few decades. So that's really fast growth. That's not how a crocodile grows. Um, and then there's a lot of other evidence that dinosaurs were more active, more energetic, more dynamic than people used to think. Feathers being part of that evidence. Because when you look at animals today that have feathers or hair or some type of integumentary covering, you know, just beyond normal skin, usually, you know, these are animals that have high metabolism. Uh, and they have to keep body heat in, but also sometimes they have to shed body heat. And, you know, one of the reasons that you need to keep body heat in is um, if, if it's wintertime and you're in your house or your flat and you have the boiler on, the furnace on, the fire on, whatever, um, you want to keep the windows closed, you know. You don't want the windows to be open. Then all that heat goes outside, and, and it's expensive to have the furnace on. So the feathers, the hair can help, you know, keep that heat in if you are a warm-blooded animal making your own body heat. So personally, I think feathers are a good sign that these dinosaurs were either warm-blooded or somewhat warm-blooded because nature isn't perfect. You know, it's not like everything's either cold-blooded or warm-blooded. There's intermediates. Um, but by and large, I think uh, most dinosaurs were active, energetic, intelligent, dynamic. They grew fast. They were more like birds. And a lot of them were probably warm-blooded or kind of becoming Okay, um, and can you talk a little bit about the colors that they have? Because when we see in Jurassic Park, we see them grayish, blackish, and, well, there are some new discoveries that say that actually they had um, pretty colorful, they were pretty colorful. So can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, this, this is one of the, the most stunning discoveries, I think, of the last few decades, that we can tell the colors of dinosaurs. People used to say this was impossible. We'll never know what color a T-Rex or a Triceratops was. You know, you can make it up. Maybe they were purple. Maybe they were green. Maybe they had polka dots or stripes. And we'll <laughs> never know. But uh, in the, the late 2000s, a, a, a grad student, Jakob Winter from Denmark, uh, he figured it out. He figured out that in some dinosaur fossils, in the feathers, if they're well-preserved enough, you can see these things called melanosomes, which are basically little bubbles that have pigment inside of them pigment that gives the feathers the color. And we know from modern animals that melanosomes of different sizes and shapes correspond to different colors. 
And that means if you can put a dinosaur feather under the microscope and see the melanosomes and measure them, you can actually predict what color those melanosomes would affect. So we know now that some dinosaurs were white, some were black, some were brown, some were red, some had multiple colors, some had stripes, some had camouflage patterns, or some were darker on the top and lighter on the bottom. Some even had shiny feathers, iridescent feathers, like crows and other birds do today. So really, it seems like dinosaurs probably had a great diversity, a great variety of colors, just like modern birds. Um, and now we have, it's going to be hard for me to try to say that in a correct English, so <laughs> be patient. Um, it's from Pedro Henrique Tunis. Do you think feathers and pterosaurus pycnofibers could be homologous? If so, feathers are the basal trait of all dinosaurs or no? Yes. Uh, that's the simple answer, yes. Uh, the, more, the more complex answer is just, you know, for those of you that might not know some of those big long words. Um, some pterosaurs, which are not dinosaurs, pterosaurs are close cousins of dinosaurs. Some pterosaurs have been found with these little things that look like little hairs, basically, uh, both on the body, but also making up the wing. And some of these little hairy things actually branch out. They divide out, just like feathers do. Uh, for me, that you know, indicates that they probably are homologous, that basically they have the same evolutionary origin. And if that's the case, then the common ancestor of dinosaurs, of pterosaurs, would have had some type of simple feather, meaning every dinosaur, at least ancestrally, would have had feathers. Now, some dinosaurs might have lost feathers, the same way dolphins lose hair, you know, or whatever, um, but at least ancestrally, all dinosaurs would have had, you know, some ancestor that had feathers. I think that's probably the case. It's hard to prove it, but we have found feathers on some ornithischian dinosaurs, some of, some of the, the plant eaters with beaks. We, of course, have lots of different feather types on theropods. Nobody's found any feathers on a sauropod yet, but I predict that one day somebody will find something like that, and um, that would go to show that all dinosaurs had some type of feather. That's not to say all dinosaurs had wings. They wouldn't have all looked like big birds. They couldn't all fly. But I think all dinosaurs, there's a very good chance all dinosaurs had some type of simple hair-like feather substance, the same way all mammals have some type of hair. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and some people, Carolina, for instance, and Vinicius, they ask the same question. It's, well, it's more personal, and it's, what advice would you give to someone who's beginning their career in paleontology? Well, you know, the, 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 the most important thing for um, really any career when you're young, looking to go into some line of work, is to see what you're enthusiastic about, what you're passionate about. And if you're passionate about dinosaurs or about fossils, about evolution, um, you know, go for it, go for it, see if you can make it into a career, or if it doesn't work out, find a way to keep it part of your life. You know, there's many ways to contribute to the field uh, without being a professor or running a museum or something like that. Uh, but, you know, if you do go down that route, um, it's the normal advice, you know, make sure you get a good quality education at university, whether it's geology or whether it's biology, you know, you can do either degree, but do one of those degrees. Take as many courses as you can. Don't forget about the other sciences. Don't forget about math. Don't forget about statistics. Don't forget about writing. You know, we all have to communicate with each other and just keep learning, keep studying. Find a way to volunteer. Find a way to uh, work in a lab to help with the museum collection. Find a way to go out in the field to join a crew. If there's nothing nearby, you know, see what rocks are close to you. Uh, maybe they don't have dinosaurs, but maybe they have other fossils. Get a field guide, get some geological maps, go out and look at the rocks. Make sure you know what the laws are. You know, make sure you know who owns the land uh, so you don't get shot. Um, but go off and explore on your own. And, you know, keep reading. Reading is so important. There's so much literature out there, so many books, so many papers. A lot of stuff is open access now online. Um, you know, do a Google News alert for dinosaur. Join Twitter. See what people are saying. It's, it's, you know, keep a pulse on what's going on in the field. And then if your passion remains, you'll, you'll start to, to carve your own path. 
But the single most important thing is it's not, you know, being some kind of genius level intelligence. It's having passion and enthusiasm, um, which is, you know, what, what I think I, I have much more than the intelligence. <laughs> no, no. You have both. Um, hmm. And the last question is, can we expect new books in the future? <laughs> yeah, so uh, there, there is going to be a kid's version of this dinosaur book, um, which will come out next year. I, I don't know if it'll be in Portuguese or not, um, but I, I will have a, a follow-up to The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, so an adult pop science type of book, uh, but about mammal evolution. So I'm writing that now. Um, this afternoon, I was <laughs> writing a little bit. I didn't have much time to write today, but you know, I was tweaking one paragraph, trying to figure out how to say something. Uh, so, you know, I'm supposed to finish this by, um, you know, I, whenever I can, basically. And, you know, it, it won't be out immediately. There's lots going on, especially with coronavirus and, and teaching and you know, the university being closed and fieldwork being shut down. And then who knows what the next semester is going to be. So there's lots of uncertainty. So it's hard to find, you know, clarity in, in, in all this, but probably, you know, it, it'll be at least a year before that'll be out. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about it uh, because this is much more, you know, our evolutionary story, following from the dinosaurs uh, to today. And it's a lot of fun. I've learned a lot, uh, a lot of uh, research. And you can't see it, but behind me in my little room up here in my house, I, the floor is just covered with books and papers and, <laughs> and stuff about mammals. I never thought when I was a student studying T-Rex and wanting to study giant, scary dinosaurs that I'd be, you know, one day reading all these papers on uh, rodents and tree shrews and you know, flying lemurs and so on. But, but it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Well, that's amazing. We're very excited to, well, to read that new book as well and the kids one. And, well, I have to thank you a lot for the interview and for being able to well, be here and answer all the questions. And I know it's time for um, your son. So thank you yes, very it's, much. It's it was time. amazing. So, yeah. thank, and thank you very much for the invitation, you know. And when, when we, we touched base over email a little while ago, um, you know, it's great. It's, it's a good thing. And this just goes to show for all of you out there, you know, the world's a very connected place now. So if you, you know, if any of you are studying something, you're, whether it's dinosaurs or whatever it may be, you have a question, you want some information, reach out, send an email out. You've read somebody's paper, or that that paper inspired you, or, or you have a question about it, reach out. Start making those 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 links. Most of us love to chat. And um, and the, the other thing is for any of you out there that uh, ever find yourselves passing through Europe and, and you might be in, in Scotland once the world opens up again, um, you know, come, come by, say hello, we'll show you the dinosaurs, we'll show you the lab, show you the university. Um, we have a great master's course here, PhD program, you know, we have, we have a, a very nice program in Edinburgh, and all of you are welcome anytime to come by and, and say hi. And uh, maybe I'll see some of you in Brazil as well, uh, when I visit uh, Roberta again, whenever that may be. <laughs> Well, we hope so. You are also very welcome in our lab. So if you're any day in Belo Horizonte, <laughs> come visit, come say hi. So I thank you again you. very, very much. It was incredible. I guess everybody loved it. I know everybody <laughs> did. So thank you again, once again. Thank it was you. incredible. Yeah, yep. obrigado, everybody. Thank you. And uh, we'll uh, see you all down the line, all right? So take care. Stay safe. Stay well. I know right now it's a tough time in Brazil like it is in the U.S. Uh, and the U.K. with the virus, you know. So just uh, wear your masks, keep your distance, be safe, be, be calm, and, um, you know, keep on keeping on. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Bye-bye.